Hello, my name's David Sweet and I would like to talk to you about my healing journey. On the 11th of June 2019, David Sweet was on his way to his usual morning at the gym when he received a phone call from his doctor. The doctor informed David that he needed to pack his things immediately and present to hospital to be admitted for treatment. Diagnosis, acute myeloid leukemia. The medical experts gave David very little chance of survival and advised him that unless he undergo immediate intense chemotherapy treatment, he would only have three months to live. But David knew that the answer to his recovery wasn't in the word of the doctors, but in the word and in the presence of God. Today we will hear from David and his wife Lindy about his healing journey. First of all, I'd like to say to you too that God wants you well. Uh, God wants everybody well. It's part of the atonement, healing, and the forgiveness of sins goes together. And so um, I just wanted to share an experience that happened to me. Um, the enemy came out and attacked my body uh, in June of 2019. And uh, this is my healing journey. Uh, really, it goes back to about 1996, where the Lord spoke to him and warned him that the enemy was going to try and take him out. And David, I knew something had happened because I saw the blood drain from his face, but he didn't talk about it. He didn't say anything about it. And then about May, he, we went to a conference and he got very ill, uh, went to the doctor. The doctor said it was a virus and he just got worse and worse and worse. So he was, during that time, he was using his faith, um, but the symptoms were getting worse and he was seeking the Lord about it. Eventually, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail. And it was after that time that he started to get um, better. He was improving. The doctors had actually sent him to the infectious diseases uh, specialist at the hospital. And he believed that what it was, was a staphylococcal infection in his blood, which was deadly and there was no cure for it. Now, this is obviously a long time ago and uh, the Lord <clears throat> showed me at the time that that passage of scripture where Jesus said, I pray for you that your faith won't fail, that, that passage is actually Luke 22, 31 to verse 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Um, and in, in Luke 4, 13, after Jesus was tempted, it says, Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So we'd realized that it was a straight out attack from the enemy. The devil uh, had come to try and take David out to sift him as wheat. But the Lord had prayed for him that his faith wouldn't fail and he recovered. So as we do with most things after that happened, we didn't think a whole lot more about it. But last year in May, I went off on holidays with my daughter to Europe. In the time that I was away, he'd had slight nausea and um, it had been niggling at him for a while and he was thinking, oh, it's just because Lindy's away. We'd been married for nearly 48 years and very rarely separated. But he spoke to me about it and we said, you know, we determined that it would be fine for him to go and see the doctor, you know, and just get checked out. Well, the next thing we knew, on June the 12th, he uh, phoned me, I think I was in Budapest at the time, and he phoned me and said, um, the doctors are admitting me to hospital. They say I have leukemia. The, when, I, when I was diagnosed, it was a really, really big shock to me because I'd been going to the gym. I didn't have any symptoms or anything. <clears throat> and um, one thing I didn't do is I didn't think that, um, God, you've done this to me. That wasn't even the equation because God is a good God. And he, John, Jesus told us in John chapter 10, verse 10, don't get mix, mixed up with the thief. It's the thief that comes to kill, steal and destroy. But I've come that you'd have life and life more abundantly. Not just abundantly, but more abundantly. So I never ever, that was a process. And I didn't even think, well, God, you're allowing it. Or God's trying to do something to teach me a lesson. That was not even entered into my mind. I knew this was attack from the enemy. His first response was death is not an option. The Lord's called me to healing ministry. Um, I'm going to see lots of people healed. I'm not old enough to die yet, and I'm going to survive this, which is the right response to have. 
But one of the first things the Lord said to me was that David's suite, like Abraham, David's suite is full of faith, giving glory to God and fully persuaded. And that was a great comfort to me. That was the first thing that the Lord spoke to me about the situation. And I knew that David's faith would not fail the same way that it hadn't failed back in 1996. And I also realized that in that passage of scripture, when Jesus was tempted, it said that the devil was, was seeking after a more opportune time. And, and we recognized that this was an attack of the enemy. I think that perhaps he thought it was an opportune time because I was away. You know, we were hardly ever separated. So I was away at that time. He kind of went behind my back as well <laughs> and did this attack against David. I think the number one thing that I noticed at the beginning was he never signed for the package. I know we've done some children's ministry and one of the examples we did was to make up a little box with some snakes in it with a clear top and we put in the, the church's kids church name and address on the top and a, a postman or a delivery person was meant to come to the church and say here this is for you. You know, if someone came to your door, knock, knock, knock on the door and here, this is a delivery for you and they try and give you a box of snakes and it says on it, danger, poisonous snakes. Are you going to take delivery of that? <laughs> well, when David was diagnosed by the doctors with a deadly disease, acute myeloid leukemia, something which they have no cure for, was he going to sign for it? No way. He just refused to accept any of that. He, he, as far as he's concerned, by Jesus' stripes, he was healed yes. 2,000 years ago. So anyone that had to be told, I did that on his behalf. I wouldn't even It was talk also about really it. important not to Google it. No. You know, first thing a lot of people do when the doctor tells them they've got something wrong with them or if they get a symptom in their body, they want to Google it. And, you know, they turn... Um, something that might be a minor headache into a brain tumor and next thing you know they think they're going to die so we couldn't do that yeah you know it's amazing that people want to google stuff they want to talk about their sickness or disease my scars are bigger than you or this all this sort of thing and you know really they know more about the disease than they do of god's words and god's promises right. and i never googled it i still haven't googled it um people ask me what i've got and i usually send them to lindy because i didn't even <laughs> say what I was diagnosed with, but I never took ownership of it because it's not mine. I'm not signing for anything I didn't order and not having anything I didn't order. The doctors had given him three months to live without any radical chemotherapy. Uh, and being word of faith people and knowing the word of God, you know, we know that when we sow the seed of faith, it grows. But when a doctor gives you three months to live, it's a shock. It's a shock for anyone, especially when all you've had is a bit of a queasy tummy and, and a, that was really nothing to do with leukemia anyway, we found out. Um, so, you know, we had to do a bit of thinking and seeking the Lord. He didn't have a check about having the chemotherapy. So, and because it takes a while for the seed of faith sometimes to come up, you know, everyone's healing journey is different. Uh, we've seen a lot of people instantly heal, but sometimes it takes a little while for that seed to grow. So we thought, three months, let's do some chemo. And in the meantime, we'll seek the Lord because it's all about relationship. You know, the Lord has spoken to David in 1996 and said, I pray for you that your faith won't fail. So we knew that the Holy Spirit was there to help. He is our helper. He's our comforter. He's there all the time whenever we need him. And um, David experienced his presence in some just remarkable ways when he was in hospital as well. We decided that he would do the chemo and continue to seek the Lord for an exit time. But when was the right time to stop the chemo? I used my faith and I actually took authority over that chemo th chemotherapy. I would lay my hands above it and I would say, Kim, I take authority over you in the name of Jesus. You'll have no harmful effects on my body or my organs in Jesus' name, but you will go and kill any cancer, any kind of leukemia cells, anything that's not of God, you will kill, but there'll be no harmful effects of my body. And that worked through the whole process. I was never, ever sick from any rounds of chemo. I lived normally in the hospital. One thing I said to Lindy, I said, I might be in the hospital, but I'll never let the hospital get inside of me. And I 
didn't like hospitals. I still don't like hospitals. And like I said to Lenny, I don't like hospitals. There's too many sick people here and I'm not sick. So I never laid around in bed all day. I got my, my pajamas when I went to bed at night. I got dressed up, up in my normal clothes during the day and I walked and did a normal life. I'd walk around where I could in the ward and so forth. I transitioned from believing by Jesus stripes I was healed because I've known that and I know that's true. The word says that, there's no disputing that. But I was transitioning from believing I was healed to knowing I was healed because I knew that the doctors really, there is no um, actual, uh, really cure for this um, particular leukemia and the doctors want to take me down a pathway with bone marrow and stem cell and all that kind of thing which doesn't really give you an outcome anyway and so I knew that I had to, to, to get away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and drop, drop over to the tree of life because Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life and one of the main scriptures that I use is in um, James chapter 4 says 7 it says therefore submit to God Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's in three parts. So first of all, it says to submit to God. Well, God's will is for everyone to be saved, everyone to be healed, everybody to be delivered, for everybody to have an abundant life. So that's submitting to God's will. God's will is in the Bible. Jesus was the express image of God the Father and he went around teaching, preaching and healing. And eight multitudes came to Jesus and he healed them all, A-double-L. And so I knew that for a fact that healing was God's will for my life. And it says then to resist the devil. That means to actively fight against. You have to resist the devil. And it says then he will flee from you. So that was one of the main scriptures that I stood on. It's really, really important for us. Our first reaction is that uh, we have to resist these things that are coming against us. Now, some people think God's trying to put sickness on disease to teach them a lesson or something, but I find this is amazing because people that actually believe that will go to the doctor to try and get rid of it, which to me is quite foolish. And so we've got to realize that God's will for us is to be well, amen? And we've got to know who's the good guy and who's the bad guys. I remember the old movies when I watched as a kid, they had the black and white television and they had cowboys and Indians. And the goodies always were the, wore the white hats and the baddies were, wore the black hats. So God has always got the white hand because he is with us. He's innocent for us. And when I was in hospital, God helped me tremendously. I was uh, in that place, like Lydia said, like the God bubble, dwelling in the secret place uh, of the Most High. When this happened to me, I can't say that I, I don't think I have any kinds of fear, basically. There are maybe about four times, not even a dozen, half, it wouldn't even been half a dozen times that external fear tried to come against me. And I just had to speak to that fear. And I said, fear, I resist you, get out in the name of Jesus. And that will work for you because the word of God works for anybody. And I go to bed at night and I would say, God, I think that you, you're in me, that you're with me and that you're for me. And I used to sleep fantastically, really well, because I wasn't worried about it. During the time that David was going through all this, um, and not a lot of people, but a few people spoke to me and said, look, we realise that you're his main support and that it's not easy for you. Obviously, I was running around to the hospital all the time. Um, we'd been warned by the nurses that the hospital food was disgusting, so I was cooking meals and trying to look after him in the best way that I could, as well as doing all the other things that needed doing at home. And they'd say to me, you know, how are you? And I was just able to say to them, you know, it's like living in a parallel universe. I have this, I call it the God bubble that surrounds me. And I'm just living in the constant presence and the peace of God. I had no fear. I had no doubt. I could live in peace the whole time. And... Um, I just knew that God, this was going to have a good outcome. And I also knew that I couldn't afford to step out of that God bubble. Once my foot got out of there, which happened on a couple of occasions where we'd got a negative report from the doctor or something like that had happened, I'd get a toe into that water over in that other universe and I'd pull it back quick. I'd have to take hold of my thought life and cast down all those imaginations and the things that the doctor was saying and remind myself of what the word of God was saying. 
And I think the main scripture for me that I used was Psalm 91. Now I've read that Psalm 91 in the Talmud, um, they're told to say that seven times a day for healing, which was very interesting. But in my case, because I wasn't the one who needed healing, it was something that really held me steadfast the whole time. Because it says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, well, that's my God bubble. If I stay in that bubble, I'm fine. Then it goes on to say in verse 2, I will say of the Lord. You know, our words are so important. When trouble comes, we need to be speaking the word of God. We're saying of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. We're not trusting in the doctors. You know, the doctors are just human. And they operate under the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which fluctuates and changes. Where we, as Christians, we should be looking to the tree of life. That's what we need. We need the tree of life. In verse 3, it says, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. And I know with David, every day he's thanking the Lord. Thank you, Father, that you've delivered me from the snare of the fowler. <laughs> and uh, we're just so grateful for that. In verse 4, it also says, His truth shall be your shield and buckler. David had spent 36 years in the word of God, sowing that seed into his heart. And Jesus said, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when trouble comes and the pressure's on, what's on the inside of you is what's going to come out of your mouth. So I want to encourage you today to sow the seed of the word of God in there now before trouble comes. Because when the pressure's on, that's what's going to come out. We don't want to be just placid and going on with what all the doctors are saying. It also says in verse 5, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night. There were times, not many, but just occasionally, as I said, where I'd get my foot out of the God bubble and fear would try and come on me. Usually it was through a doctor's report because they were incredibly negative. They gave no hope whatsoever. And... I would have to go away then and I'd have to speak the word over myself. God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love and a sound mind, a safe thinking mind. And I'm not going to allow my mind to go there. I'm only going to think on things that are good, pure, lovely and a good report. And that's what you have to do. You have to stand on that word of God. When we stay in that place, that secret place of the Most High, it stops all the turmoil and all the other things coming in because you've been surrounded and crowded by negative thoughts and, and, and negative uh, reports from the doctors, things aren't going well. And when, they, <laughs> when the doctors give you this sort of thing, they, they, can, they want you to just keep on doing the treatment forever and ever and ever. And I thought, there's no way in the world that I'm gonna do it. They wanted me to have, um, I think it was like a stem cell or a bone marrow transplant. And when the doctor said this, this was the trajectory or the path they had for me, I just got the biggest N-O, capital no way, Jose. I'm not doing that. They're not going to knock out all my bone marrow, the bone marrow that God gave to me, because it's good. I've just received something like the, Jesus said about the enemy sowed these tears in amongst the wheat. And, you know, the thing is that I'm not going to go down that pathway because my God is bigger. My God can get rid of anything. We've just got to resist the devil and flee from us. And one thing I found, especially after decades of ministering to people over healing, a lot of people are really passive about this whole healing thing. And they come up to seeing God's will. Yes, it's God's will for heal me. So I'm going to pray and ask God to heal me. But I find that they pray and ask God to, to heal them and they sit back like a bump on a log, passive, like saying, well, I've prayed about it. I'm just waiting on God. Listen, you're never waiting on God. God's already provided healing for you 2,000 years ago. He's waiting for you to believe and receive. And it's up to us to navigate through that and receive what Jesus has already prayed for us 2,000 years ago. And one thing we did when we first got diagnosed, we limited the amount of people that we told. Because sometimes people think if you tell everybody and we get more and more people praying, that's going to be good. But listen, a lot of times you tell people and they're going behind your back. Say your name is Joe Bloggs. They'll go around and say, hey, have you heard Joe Bloggs has got cancer? That's not speaking the answer. That's just speaking the problem. You don't need to be telling people like that. You want a people of faith that can agree and join with you that we're resisting against the sickness. And I remember telling my pastors, I said, 
I'm standing on James chapter 4, verse 7. I'm submitting to God with just health and healing. I'm resisting the devil. I'm using chemotherapy and my faith, and he will flee from me. So that's what I did. And it's very, very important. We understand, it says in Proverbs 18, verse 21, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. We don't want to be licensing the enemy or giving access into our lives by speaking bad or negative things. So death and life are in the power of the tongue. So it was important in that situation that we limited the people that we were sharing this with. And eventually the, the pastors of our church said, I think we should share this with the elders. And a lot of people uh, were praying for us, the people that could pray in faith. And eventually the pastor did share it with some of the church and the congregation. And eventually he got up one Sunday morning and he said, David, sweet, he is healed. And that stopped anybody in the congregation coming and saying, so-and-so has got this, that and the other. So it's very, very important who we share, how we navigate through this. We've got to make sure that we are speaking life. We're not speaking death. And this is a really, really important thing. I want to give a plug for uh, Emily. It's got a, a story on um, her faith talks. And it's the very, very lesson she did on um, uh, Virginia's, um, well, her really her birth and how she was born Premier and how uh, through this process that, that, that uh, Emily navigated through, especially if you look at that, it's about a 30 minute program. It's the first one that she did on Faith Talks. About from the 70 minute mark, she started to saying that the friends would ask her how she's doing and she'd give the doctor's report. And uh, little um, Virginia wasn't re really improving and how she, God spoke to her and said, you gotta speak the word only. We can't have salt water and fresh water coming from the same pond or the same thing and we can't have different messages coming out of a mouth so i'd recommend that you, you actually see that again if you haven't seen it go over and realize it because death and life are in the power of your tongue and those that love it will eat the fruit of it i remember when i did my first round of um one of the chemos the doctor said to me this type of um, chemo you get mouth ulcers oh, i've had mouth ulcers in the past i am not having mouth ulcers i do not like mouth ulcers so right there and then I pushed back at the doctor. I got in his face and said, I am not having mouth ulcers. And he said, look, everybody gets them. It's a type of, type of um, drug it is, uh, the, the chemo. It, it, people, everybody gets them. I said, I'm not having them. I actually got that back doctor. He totally backed down and he said, well, sometimes people get them. I said, well, I won't be getting them. And guess what? I did not get them because death and life are out in the power of the tongue. And Jesus said in Mark 11 verse 23, you can have what you say. The doctors give you statistics all the time. Oh, but this is a disease that always comes back. This is a disease that mutates. This is a, pe a disease that only a very small percentage of people ever survive. And Psalm 91 says, what? What does God say? You know, we have to find out what God says, not what the doctor's saying. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. And that's where we are. The doctors would say to David, oh, but we've had lots of Christians believe in God and they've died. What's the difference between you and them? Psalm 91 is. We have to believe the word of God. A thousand may fall at our side and 10,000 at our right hand, but it shall not come near us. In verse 10, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. I know at the moment there's a new disease that everyone's talking about, coronavirus or something like that. We have to stand on that word of God in Psalm 91. No evil shall befall me, nor shall any plague come nigh my dwelling. I always think of John G. Lake who when people were dying of the bubonic plague, they asked him, they, uh, one of the doctors said to him, isn't it great that we've got vaccinations or inoculations? And he said, well, what are you talking about? He didn't have any. But he said to them, put some of the foam from this person who's just died from bubonic plague into my hand and put it under the microscope and see what happens. And of course, as soon as it touched his body, every single one of those bacteria died instantly. And that's what we're like. We're children of the Most High God. Jesus has already paid the price for our healing and we stand on that word. And I also fed my word. One of the, the things that I do, because we, we've been doing uh, healing ministries now for decades, and the first thing I'll do to people, if, if they listen and they act on what I tell them, 
I said, look, Andrew Womack has got a uh, teaching, God wants you well. There's about 40 lessons there. And I said to the people, go and do this. This is where you need to start. That's what I did. I've seen this program many times before, but that's the first thing that I did for myself because that's what I tell myself to do. And that's what we did. And I doubled up on the word because the God's word is life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. So we, we just, every day I was in the word and doing things and teachings and so forth. So I think as David mentioned um, earlier, he was in a process. He knew that he had some faith and he was sowing that seed of faith uh, and waiting for a manifestation and waiting for an exit strategy, but also waiting for that time when he, instead of believing that he was healed, that he actually had a knowing on the inside of him. You know, when you have a revelation, you know that you know that you know that you know, and no one can talk you out of it, not even the doctors. Because you, you have that assurance on the inside of That's what faith is. Faith is an assurance. It's a confidence. And um, they said that was the process for him. It was a healing journey. And everyone's healing journey is different. It doesn't matter how you get healed. No. As long as you get healed. No bad good. way to get healed. Praise the Lord. If you need to go to the doctors, go to the doctor. Yeah. Remember, this is faith in God. This is not faith in faith. It says in 1 John 5 verses 14, it says, this is the confidence we have in him. This is relational, relational to, to God. We have a relationship with a good, good father and he'll take care of us. So it's not actually like a formula. And I know that you have to have a good confession, which leads me to another point. There's two parts of this confession. There's a confession unto faith and there's a confession of faith. The confession unto faith is when you're confessing something because you're still trying to renew your mind, you still haven't got to the point where you believed it yourself. And somebody be cons some people can um, make a confession maybe 5,000 times, and then on the 5,000th time, all of a sudden, bang, that's it, I have got it. But you know, the 5,000th time was the first time they believed it and they spoke it. And there's a confession of faith where you already believe and you speak. A lot of people hear the, the, the gospel, and they believe that Jesus died for their sins, they believe Jesus raised from the dead, and the first time they hear that, they believe with their heart, they confess with their mouth, and they get saved. And that's a confession of faith. So if you're not sure where you are in this equation, you need to understand there's a confession unto faith, so you're not confessing it to, to try and talk God into it, you're trying to actually renew your mind to the point where you believe it and you speak it. And there's other times we just believe it and that's a confession of faith. It talks about in Romans chapter 10 about the word of faith that we speak. The word of faith we speak. So when the people are preaching to you and you're hearing the message, that's the word of faith. But we need to convert that to the uh, spirit of faith. And this is how it goes in, in um, 2 Corinthians 4.13. 4, it says, and since we have the same spirit of faith, not the word of faith, because we've heard the word, that's what we hear, and faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God, we then need to convert that to the spirit of faith. And what is the spirit of faith? The spirit of faith believes in the heart, they speak with their mouth, and then they act upon the word of God. So it says we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written. I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore we speak. Well, to stand on the word basically means that you're going to be a doer of the word. In James chapter 1, it talks about those that hear the word and they don't do it. It's like looking in a mirror and they go away and they forget what they look like. Well, they hear the word and they forget. They become forgetful hearers. But it says there that the doer of the word, the one that does the word, they're the ones that get blessed. It's a bit like the parable in Mark chapter 7 where Jesus talked about two people that build a house. And the two people built the house, one built upon the rock and one per per person built on the sand. And the winds and the storm and the floods came. It's the same wind, the same flood and the same storm that comes to, to them. And one's house was destroyed, but the other person was standing because he built a house upon the rock. And I don't think of people think that this is about saying I'm being built on Jesus. Well, we can be saved like these two people here, they weren't destroyed, but their, their house or their lives were just a, a, a mess and like carnage going on because Jesus said, the wise one is who hears these sayings of mine and does them. So it's the doers of the word that get blessed. It says in, um, 
in Colossians 2 verse 7, this is a real sure sign whether you've transitioned from believing to knowing that you're healed because you're going to be incredibly thankful. I often say, I'll be driving around the car today and I'll say, Lindy's in the car, I'll say, oh, thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. You've delivered me from the snare of the fowler, from the noise and pestilence, from destruction that lays, at, uh, lays waste at new day. A thousand of them fall on my side, 10,000 at right, my right hand, but it won't come near me. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm so grateful and thankful. And that's what it should be. When you receive something, if somebody gives you something, it's just polite. A kid in grade one would say thank you if you gave them something. And that's when you've tried. See, if you haven't received it yet, you can't be thankful because you're still waiting to get it. And one thing I find really, really frustrating when people are in that passive mode, well, I prayed about it, I prayed and asked God to heal me, and I'm just waiting at God. Listen, listen, listen. These are important things. You can die waiting on God. You're not waiting on God. God's waiting on you to believe and receive. Amen? So it's very, very important. It says in Colossians 2 verse 7, it says Root, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Something's established, it's been there for a long time. You know what? You can build your house in a storm, but it's not easy. It's better if you've already built your house. I built a house that had been over for 30 years, putting my faith and trust in God. And I'm not talking about me having great faith. I've just got a little mustard seed of faith in a great God, amen, that can be trusted, who's worthy. He's a good, good father, and he'll take care of you if you put your faith and trust in him. Amen. That's good preaching. Praise the Lord. And it says you're established in the faith as you have been taught. So you've already had to be taught this. Abounding, abounding, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Praise God. Once you've got something, you're incredibly grateful because you what you know that you, you know that you know in your knower that you're well that you've already got it. So praise the Lord. I hope this is a real help to you today. It says in Acts chapter ten verse thirty eight, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, who went about doing good and healing. Healing is good. Healing is good. Sickness is never a blessing in the Bible. In Deuteronomy 28, it lists the blessings and it lists the cursings. The blessings is health and healing. Sickness is a curse. And Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit who went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed of the devil. Not oppressed of God, but oppressed of the devil. God wants you well today. And the whole of the Godhead was involved in that. How God the Father anointed Jesus the Son with the Holy Spirit. They're all involved in getting healing because healing is the dinner bell of the gospel. So God wants you well today. Amen. And we just send healing to you as you're watching this podcast today. And it's a wonderful thing. If you're a believer, God has already put healing on the inside of you. It says in Romans 8 verse 11, I will just read this out here. But if the same spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, are you a believer? Are you a believer? Because if you are, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells on the inside of you. It says, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life, life, life to your mortal bodies. Where there's life, there can't be any death. Where there's light, there can't be any darkness. He's going to give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells on, on the inside of you. But if we don't activate that life on the inside of us by faith, it can lie dormant. It can just lie dormant. A lot of people like to quote the scripture in uh, Ephesians 3 verse 20 says, Our God is able to do exceedingly above all we can ask or think. And that's where they stop. But it goes on to say, according to the power that works in us. Is that power working on the inside of you today or is it dormant? And the way we activate that faith is we release it by believing, by speaking, by acting. We release it by believing in our heart, speaking with our mouth, and we act on the word. It says in James chapter 3, I think it says, that faith without action is dead. It doesn't do you any good. For me and my um, healing journey, when, I, when this first happened, I immediately spoke the word, did everything I knew to do. And I believe that by Jesus' stripes I was healed because that's the truth. 
And I used that process with the doctors in that time to transitioning from believing that by Jesus stripes I was healed to knowing I was healed. Once I knew that I was healed, I wanted to exit from the doctors. The doctors didn't want me to exit and we used to have like, like volleys of this. The doctor say, well, it always comes back. I said, no, it won't come back. She said, but it always comes back. I said, no, it won't come back. She said, but what are you going to do when it comes back? I said, look, it's not coming back. And so we did this kind of thing. I was looking for an exit scripture. And God, I had knew the scripture in Naaman 1 verse 9. It says, the Lord will make an utter end of it and affliction won't arise a second time. That's really important for kind of diseases where the doctors say this is going to keep coming back. You need to get rid of it and that's it. You know, when God heals you, you're healed. So when I'd made that decision and realized I need to exit from the doctors, I'm not having any more chemotherapy. I wasn't given a clean bill of health. I wasn't, um, was, what else would you add to that, Lindy? Um, I just, just knew that I knew. See, when you know that you're healed, I mean, they wanted me to come up and have all these other things done and continue with uh, just even the testing. I said, I said, why would you want to exit on my leg if it's not broken? So I just knew I had to exit. And um, I had this name in one nine. I was hoping somebody was going to give me a word, which I was just calling that in my heart. David had actually mentioned this to me, um, Nahum 1.9, and he said, you know, I've been speaking this out, out aloud, I've been standing on it, so even the enemy can hear it. And he said, I'm really looking for an exit scripture from God, something personal, because remember, we're trusting God, and it's relational. So all the way through, David was being led. So David um, still didn't have a check about stopping the chemo. The Lord gave him another word about the strong spirit of a man sustains him in illness. Yes. Um, which really strengthened him and helped him go keep going, but he knew it wasn't time to disconnect. So he's thinking about Nahum 1.9, and I was praying about it as well. And I got from the Lord um, the passage of Scripture from when Jesus was on the cross, and it said, it is finished. Um, but I didn't tell David because I thought, no, he needs to find out for himself. Yes, that's good. So after the fourth lot of chemo, fourth round of chemo, he knew that he was healed. The, the results had been clear for a long time anyway, but he believed that he was healed. He, well, not believed, he had gone from believing to knowing. He had a knowing on the inside of him that he was healed. Mm. Um, but he just wanted that confirmation, that exit scripture. And um, our pastor got up this day, and as David said to him, I know I'm healed. So he got up this day in front of the whole congregation <laughs> He says, is it all right if I tell them you, that you're healed? And he said, yeah, that's fine. So he got up, told the whole congregation that David was healed. So at the end of the service, we're just out in the aisle and this young mother who comes to our church came up to us and she said, oh, I've been praying for you with incredible compassion and tears and the Lord's given me something for you. Mm. And uh, the Lord had given her a psalm which David read and to be honest with you it didn't do a whole lot in him um, and later she said that she believed that was for her benefit as well while she was praying mm. but at the end of it um, she ended up emailing it to us and at the end of it in capital letters it said it is finished wow <laughs> and that was and it went off wow. in there like a bomb didn't it oh yes when I saw those three words they meant so much to me they were worth the, the, the whole book of Psalms because that was just God speaking to me through this young mother. Yeah. It is finished. And it was it finished with the attack. It was finished with the doctors. It is finished. I mean, what part about it is finished, don't I understand? That was what I wanted. Oh, praise God. That was wonderful. And I was able to confirm then and say, well, you know, that's the exact scripture that God gave me. And he knew that God had given me a verse because I told him. But yes. I said, I'm not going to tell you. You need to find out for yourself. And that was it. So... Through the mouth of two or three, three witnesses, witnesses and everything be established. established. And so he had the witness on the inside of him and he had two other people as well. And you know, like if you're in a similar situation, my pathway to healing is different to your pathway, but God will give you a pathway and God's pathway always works. It'll lead you to success and total, total healing and restoration. But you don't want to do anything foolish because, you know, it talks about in James that Abraham believed God and was counted for righteousness. And it talks in that same passage there, I think it's uh, chapter 3 of James, it says, faith without works is dead. Now, faith produces actions, but actions don't produce faith. So I've spoken to people that are trying to, to get healing for their sight. There was one lady I was speaking to had big milk thick uh, bottle 
Milk glasses. And she'd actually taken her glasses off and stood on them and broken, but she was still as blind a bat. So she's trying to use actions to, pr to produce faith, but it doesn't work that way. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word again, God, and then our faith, our believing, then will produce actions. So you don't want to be disconnecting from doctors or things that are helping or assisting you this time until you know that you know that you know that you have a word from God. God is the one to lead. Listen, in, lo in him we live and move, have, have, have our very being. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. In him's life. And mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as God over your life, he will direct you. He will guide you. And if you just follow his pathway, it will always have a good outcome. It doesn't matter if you have something that's incurable because nothing is impossible with God. And nothing's impossible with he who believes. And God's given us that ability to believe and trust him. You know, faith is spelled T-R-U-S-T. Either right. you trust him or you don't trust mm. him. He's a good, good father. And he's given us everything we need in this life that comes through the knowledge of him. It says in that in 2 Peter chapter 1, that everything we need in this life to be victorious and overcoming, it's already in the Bible. It's not hidden from us, it's hidden for us. So praise God. And then the very last part I wanted to share from Psalm 91 is, with long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. David's getting up in years and so am I, but he's not satisfied and neither am I. And we've had a lot more work to do for the Lord. Now we're going to get even with the enemy for this attack that's come against us. And God is satisfying us with long life and he's showing us his salvation, which includes healing, deliverance, prosperity, everything that we need in life. Jesus has said the thief comes to steal, to kill and to destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. No, I was never ever discharged from the medical system to say everything's okay and tickety-boo. But I had another doctor that says, by my stripes you're healed and it is finished. It's a done deal. So I'm walking on that and I'm very happy and I'm thankful. God has delivered me from the snare of the fowl. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. So wherever you are today, God has got a healing journey for you and a pathway you can follow. You don't have to follow my pathway. I don't have to follow your pathway. And there's nothing wrong with the doctors. I'm not against doctors. Jesus said the sick need a physician. Praise the Lord. But I've found another doctor, a doctor, a Jewish doctor, who doesn't charge me anything because he bulk billed 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah. So praise God. I swap doctors and I'm healthy and I'm well. And I'm out near, out near now, still doing even more healing meetings. And I'm just uh, so excited that God's given me life. I'm so grateful and thankful. There's somebody is actually watching this, is watching this, and you're suffering from a trauma. Now, I don't know whether that trauma could be a car accident. It could be an industrial accident. It could be some sort of other accident and you say, well, I don't really need healing because I'm not actually sick. But let me tell you, God's got a promise for everything. Whatever you face in this life, there's always an answer in the Word of God for you, regardless of what it is. So you don't have a sickness, but you have a trauma in your life, and God is going to send the Word to you right now. I believe healing's coming to the body. And there's a scripture in uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 70, says, the Lord says, I will restore you unto health, and heal you of your wounds. So you're wounded through that, that trauma. I just speak, send the word according to uh, Psalm 120 verse, 107 verse 20, that God sent his word and delivered them from their destruction. So we send the word of healing to you right now in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. There's no time or distance in the spirit world. And as you're watching this podcast today, Healing is coming to your body right now in the name of your Jesus. Receive it and start thanking God for it because it's so. Hallelujah. God wants you well. We're grateful for what God's done. And every single day we're thankful for what he's doing in our life. And we know the best is yet to come. We just command that healing that's already on the inside of you to go to every cell in your body, regenerating 
revitalizing, renewing and restoring you to health right now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're not a believer, that doesn't matter. Jesus still paid the price for you to be saved and healed. We send healing to you right now in Jesus' name. Father, I just thank you that as you uh, people hear this podcast today, Father, that you are confirming your word, Father, the word that's preached, Father, and we know that it's your will for people to be healed. So we praise and we thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Be blessed, be well, be healthy, and have a long life. Amen.